we lost six Cambodians one day because they, they forgot where they put the, the booby traps and they went out to retrieve them, blew themselves to bits, and that was the worst part, I suppose, going out and picking them up and knowing who they were. They were officers and they, you know, they were uh, friends, if not good friends. Bear in mind, those guys that lost their lives there, they were my mates, and I think about those every... Specifically, Anzac days and reunions, those faces are not there, so they, uh, they are very much to the forefront, yes. There, there's a lot of bad things, you know, like you, you see, you know, guys getting killed and, and killed is probably uh, uh, an easy way of saying it because nine time, most times they end up getting mutilated. That night will never leave me because I think, I think that night alone I, I probably prayed for the first time in my life. Your worst experience in life was a mine going off, or five of them, and seeing fellas blowing up in front of you. Nothing compares to that in life. We had to actually ambush on the site, and there was a I remember as we moved in, there was a foot still in a boot. If I look back at experiences in Vietnam, there, there are a number, and when you say the best, I don't think you could actually isolate to a best or a worst that uh, it doesn't, I don't have recollections of that. What I do have of Vietnam is the mateship. There was 33 in my platoon went to Vietnam. There were three killed, so if you look at that, that's nearly 10%. There were, there were guys obviously wounded, some guys didn't serve the full tour there but it's the mateship is the experience that comes out of that. We've never lost that bond or that friendship. It's unique. It is absolutely unique. Um, and we all try to do the right thing by each other. So if somebody goes downhill, we always try to be there. And, and in, in some way or another, we can help and, and get them out of depression or what, what, whatever the case may be. It doesn't really matter whether they were what we call pogos that stayed in the camp or not. You, you have a good bond. There's always a flak going back, like the, the artillery are called long-range snipers and drop shorts and all that sort of gear. But some artillery blokes will tell you they were there to, to stop infantry retreating. Um, there's all this sort of banter that goes on. and You know, where would you be without truckies? We used to cart you around. And, but it's, it's all good natured and, and you're all in country. And once you're on the ground over there, you were fair game. You always within eyesight virtually, so it's like a little family for that time. And when you're sort of doing all that, the garbage, going through the bush and getting shot at and you're, you're shooting people and uh, it, it changes everything. fairly close group of people 
and you've only got each other, so that kind of sticks with you and you don't make a lot of friends outside that circle. You have to rely on your buddy to save your life. And that's what he's there for, and you, you reciprocate. So unless you work as a team, everything goes wrong. And that, that follows on. It's followed on through life, and it's still there. Everyone's jumping out, going into ambush positions, and I'm yelling out, no, it's not an ambush. We're in a effing minefield, and because I was so, you know, revved up and wild, because they hadn't listened to me or my boss, I just took off and I run over about 100 odd yards to this APC. There was two guys still alive in the APC, and I, I pulled them out. And I spoke to an engineer sergeant afterwards, and he said, where I run, I run through at least 15 M16 jumper jack mines. I never set one off. Yet when the boss walked in after me, exactly the same way I'd run in, they set one of the mines off. And that's the one that got me, but it killed him. Killed the company commander, the platoon commander, the SIG. I think it was the SIG who actually trod on it, one of the SIGs, and another SIG was badly wounded. There was no fighting going on. It was just the fact that there was guys dead all over the place and it was, it was a bit of a mess, but um, I, I felt the shrapnel hit me because it, 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 when, it, when it hits you, like it's like, it's like a sledgehammer hitting you. It, you feel them hit you. And, and it, I, flew, I remember flying through the air, and, uh, but then <clears throat> when I, I got up again and I, I felt all right until uh, only a, uh, probably only a couple of minutes and I, I was losing the blood and I just felt absolutely knackered. And that's when I laid down <laughs> and went to sleep. <laughs> they all had the attitude, let's get on with it. and. Uh, I think it's probably too strong a word to say I love these young fellas, but I had great feelings for them, you know, and a lot of empathy. They were facing something terrible, and yet they're always cheerful, always getting on with the job, and seeing their mates killed and injured and wounded, getting sick, didn't matter to them. They wanted to get the 12 months over and done with and go home. You get put into a circumstance where someone has to do something, and people do it. And probably the army, it's that Anzac, it's that spirit, it probably is all tied. But, but let's face it, it doesn't have to be the army to do that. It's happening in life every day, isn't it? People are standing up and being counted. It is, it's the positives, it's the fantastic things that people do. you become very aware of how vulnerable you really are. And then one day they come up to you and said, you're going home tomorrow. Pack your bags, four o'clock the plane comes and you're back in Australia within 24 hours. And they said, see you later, go back to work. 
There was no one there to meet you because we were only told the day before we had, didn't have phones to uh, let our parents know to come and pick us up or anyone else. So we were on our own. A lot of people avoided us. So you just didn't talk about it. You didn't tell anyone you was a vet. You just went back to work and did what you were supposed to do. One of the first things I did the day after I got back was go into town to buy some clothes and, and it was the 3rd of December that day so of course Rundle Street's two-way traffic and buses and all that and this car bloody backfired and I was in the gutter just straight down. And uh, I think that's the most embarrassing moment of my whole life. I did some work in the refinery in Adelaide um, at Lonsdale and um, there was quite a few veterans that worked there and I've only just found out in the last three or four years that they were veterans. And um, we, we never spoke about it, we never told each other um, unless there was some way of them recognising you as a military person, um, nothing would be said. So, so th there are still people out there that you wouldn't even know and I never ever mentioned it to anybody that I worked with unless they brought it up um, in conversation. Uh, and maybe had heard something about your background or, or somebody had said something to them that maybe you were in the Army, Navy or the Air Force. But yeah, it, it was, the policy was to try and keep it a secret. In general, I don't like talking about it. You know, except with your mates, you know. And even then you don't talk about worries or anything. You just talk about the good times or the funny times or the strange times or the absurd times, you know. It's a strange feeling where you, uh, something will upset you immensely, but you can't put your finger on it. There's no reason why you say, that shouldn't have upset me, but it has, and you exaggerate it out of all proportion. Uh, a millisecond fuse or microsecond fuse, and I just fly off the handle, and yeah. I used to do a lot of fight and flight, as they call it. Big argument out the door in the car and gone for hours and hours on end. And you come back home with your tail between your leg and think, well, that was pretty silly, but you do it again three days later. If you weren't bright enough or, or, or motivated enough to go and do something about it, you just became worse. And a lot of people just committed suicide. I've sat with a gun in my mouth for a couple of occasions. I still had the business. And I thought, well, the only thing that stopped me was the fact that my wife would, would be the one to find me. And, you know, I've had friends fall by the wayside and they're not here today. And I think if you can recognise the problems and try and get to them first, uh, I think that's important. You know, they, they just reach the, the bottom of the well and can't see a way out. So unless someone's there, another vet's there to put his arm around him and say, come on, mate, and get him some help straight away, they're going to do it. I'm not saying that you, you ever recover from it, but you learn to manage it. That's, that's the secret is to learn to manage it and to recognise the, um, uh, recognise the signals that you are going downhill and um, go and see the people that are out there to help to get you back on the rails. I've never liked the dark since I got back from Vietnam and I've always told my family don't creep up and go boo and don't touch me in the dark and don't hide behind the door and jump out and go boo because you, you won't like it. <laughs> I had blokes in the job playing tricks on me, yes. I used to call for a, a rendezvous and they'd throw a few crackers at me while, while my back was turned, um, just to see what would happen. <laughs> How far can you crawl under a police car? <laughs> motorbike gives me the freedom to be with a friend, which is what the bike is, and it's unconditional, and away I go, and it's what I did when I was a child, because, you know, Vietnam absolutely destroyed all the fun in me. It took all the fun out of me. It took, it took, you know, I was, I was you know, back in this country at 20, 21, and there was no fun left. The freedom, get out on the road, go for a, a ride. <laughs> It doesn't really matter where you're going, actually. I just, it's just nice to go. And, but we get together, go for rides up in the hills every now and then. We got a group of vets. Um, 
we just go somewhere just for mutual company because we can talk to each other. We can say anything to each other and not upset each other. Yeah, three or four of us. Yeah, we have a counter lunch, coffee somewhere. Hit the road for a couple of hours. Max, hello Max, how are you? That's John Cookie. Yeah, hello Cookie, how are you mate? That doesn't diminish our camaraderie between the, all of us. No, I, I joke with them, I say, look, you know, don't mess around me fellas, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> I think it'll be till the day we die. Yeah, if somebody needs uh, help, we're always there to back them up. I just thought, <laughs> I just thought that a couple of boats come up. can hear it for miles off. It's got a very unique sound. Out of all, all the things I've, I've done in the Army, I think it was still a thrill to fly in a Huey. The Huey was a workhorse. We went everywhere by Huey, and it's sort of just part of us. Huey coming when you're on the ground, he's coming to take you back. And he's gonna fly you back to the dat. You've been out for however many days, weeks, or whatever, and you're told, you know, the choppers are coming and all you're, all you're doing is getting ready to move out to where they're going to pick you up, but you're listening. And I'd always be the last one on. Sit on the floor like this with your legs hanging out the door, 3,000 feet up, and you check the, the height thing. I'm 3,000 feet up, and here's my feet swinging, a chopper would bank, and you'd be looking straight at the ground, not hanging on to anything. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I'd like to be surrounded by photos of it because as an infantry soldier, it means a lot to you. Yeah, the memorial dedication in Canberra was a classic example. I was standing there in the dark waiting for the dawn service to start, and you could feel the cold creeping up your legs from the asphalt. And then suddenly you could hear a, a Huey, and you could see the blokes stirring and their wives were saying, what is it, what is it? And a couple in front of me said, there's a Huey, and she said, it's nothing at all, it's just the birds. No, it's a Huey. The helicopter suddenly appeared, and I saw guys crying their eyes out. You know, it's just something that brought everything back. It brought a tear to your eye. It was that emotional. And you say, oh, that's all Huey. It's almost part of you. It just puts a chill up your spine. The dawn service, that single Huey, yeah, that wrecked everyone there, I think. No, Huey is a part of your life. Yeah, they're special. I knew I was different. Everyone, oh my, you know, my parents said I wasn't the same fellow when I came back. Uh, I more basically thought that the rest of the world had changed. Being away from two years makes is a fair difference. And uh, fact was, I'd changed and didn't know it. I think that I did the job that I was there to do um, as best I could and I don't think I let any of my mates down. 
which was important to me. And obviously a guy like me can come back here. I don't believe Vietnam had a great detrimental effect on me. A lot of people would say that I was mad when I went there. And that's probably true in that, but I don't think I've got much worse. When I came home, I kept a low profile, so, um, and just used to watch some the morons on television. I just think that now that I understand more about it, I think that I'm a better person to be around now in the later years. It's only in the last few years since I've had grandkids and my, my granddaughter is my little angel and uh, she's six, nearly seven now and uh, <clears throat> she's the only one I've ever been able to really, you know, bond with. Like, I could never show that sort of affection ten years ago. The new guys in Timor and stuff, they're not getting the help that they should be getting and they will be like us in 20 years' time. They're going to have chronic post-traumatic stress disorder and we in the pensions office have struck a couple of them already, 22 years old and incapable of working. I don't like, I don't like people judging me for being a soldier and I think with Vietnam that was, was one of the biggest problems. I had the greatest admiration for them. I still do, you know. That's why I mix with them now. Mines were my biggest worry. I didn't mind getting shot at. You know, that was par for the course, that's what you was trained for. Um, but mines were a hidden danger down there, you just couldn't see them. Didn't know they were there until you hear the bang. Jumping jacks jump out the ground three seconds after you step on them. So they're designed to jump up behind you and take out quite a few fellas. And, um, five weeks in a minefield, you sort of, every step you took, you subconsciously counted to three. If you reached three, you knew you were all right. Next step, you started again, so. For five weeks, I was counting up to three. I made it. <laughs>